This presentation is brought to you by the Friends of the Amazing Facts Ministry. Coming up next on Amazing Facts Presents. And we've got to know when unity's great and when you got to say I'm drawing a line when it comes to biblical truth. I'm not compromising truth for unity. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Today's presentation is an excerpt from the Prophecy Code video series. The USA in Bible Prophecy. Turn in your Bibles with me, please. Revelation 17. I'm going to do a little reinforcement on that first beast and then go to the second beast because she's mentioned here. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me saying, Come here, come hither, and I'll show you the judgment of the great whore that sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness... And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet-colored beast. What color? Scarlet. Who, with uh, names full of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman is arrayed in purple. What color? And scarlet. Adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead, boy, forehead comes up a lot in Revelation, doesn't it? On her forehead was written a name, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now, do you really think there's some woman walking around in the last days who's got this whole paragraph in her head, dressed like this, riding on a beast, or is this obviously symbolic language? That's why we need these prophetic keys to unlock these things. By the way, the Old Testament prophets of Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah, they talk about Babylon also as well as uh, even as far back as uh, um, in the books of uh, Genesis. You can find some reference there. I'll tell you more about that later. Now we're going to go through and look at some of the identifying characteristics of this first beast. Remember that woman is riding the same first beast you saw in Revelation 13, right? Seven heads, ten horns. First of all, just very quickly to review these things, it says that she's guilty of what? Blasphemy. Both scriptures say this beast is guilty of blasphemy. We've learned blasphemy is putting yourself in position of God or taking the prerogatives that belong to God. Now here's a quote from a book that was a bestseller by Pope John Paul II. Um, I believe that he's a very sincere man. It's called Crossing the Threshold of Hope, but I would have to respectfully disagree with this statement. Confronted with the Pope, and this is on the opening page, confronted with the Pope, one must make a choice. The Pope is considered the man on earth who represents the Son of God, who takes the place of the second person, takes the place of the second person of the omnipotent God of the Trinity. The leader of the Catholic Church is defined by the faith as the vicar of Jesus Christ and is accepted as such by believers. Well, basically, it says he's here on earth to take the place of the second person of the Trinity. God the Father first, God the Son second, taking the place of God the Son. I remember Jesus saying I would send the Holy Spirit as my representative. I think it's blasphemous when a man says I am here as the representative of Jesus. Furthermore, it says she's dressed in what color? Purple and scarlet. Purple is a color that represents royalty and scarlet is a color that represents sin. The Bible says, though the Isaiah chapter 1, though thy sins be as scarlet. Verse 5, she's called the what? The mother. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's a mother church. A woman represents a church. The term mother, now I'm reading from the Catholic Encyclopedia, volume 6, uh, 1909. The term mother church, however, as applied to Rome, has special significance as indicating its headship of all churches. goes on now, get this. And the woman that you saw, if you have any doubts, last verse of the chapter, if you have any doubts about who this first beast is, we're now in Revelation 17. That woman that you saw is that great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. All right, help me. Who wrote the book of Revelation? Where was John, the apostle, when he wrote the book of Revelation? He was in Patmos. 
Was he there freely on vacation or was he a prisoner? Who put him there? Rome. Who was ruling the world? Rome. That woman that you saw is that great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. Is there any doubt when you start thinking about a woman or church that is in Rome what this beast power is? That's why I read you that litany of Bible scholars that all agreed, and these are the great minds of the church, with what I'm teaching you. I'm not teaching you anything new or original. I'm teaching you what has been lost by the church. And we're trying to rediscover our roots as a Bible people. The average Christian in North America is biblically illiterate now. If they don't get it from the radio or television preacher, they don't know what's going on. Very few people wake up and read their Bible for themselves and study their Bible comparing Scripture with Scripture. I hope these meetings are inspiring you to spend some time in Bible study. Amen, friends? In what year was the papacy predicted to lose its world influence? We've known and learned that in 1798, uh, after the French Revolution, in connection with that, General Berthier captured the Pope who died in captivity, both figuratively and literally ending the papal reign that lasted exactly 1,260 years from 538 to 1798. Which nation was predicted to arise around the same time as the papacy was receiving his deadly wound? It says in Revelation 13, verse 11 and 12, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. All right? Two horns like a lamb, and he speaks like a dragon. What country was starting out as a Christian nation like a lamb right around the time that the papacy received a deadly wound? Only one nation was being born that would become a world power that prophecy would deal with. Now, are you aware that many of the settlers that came to our country, they were not all conquistadors looking for money. Many of them that came were looking for religious freedom and toleration. And one of the first things the pilgrims did is they knelt down, they prayed, and they prayed over the Bible. It was a very religious group, some of the Puritans and the ones who first landed here. What is the significance of the beast coming up out of the earth? Well, we read earlier in the prophecy, Revelation 17 tells us the waters represent a densely populated area. What new vastly um, open country was in existence at that same time period? Pound for pound, people per square mile, there was a lot of land out there. This was not densely populated civilization as they had in the Roman Empire. They had all roads leading to Rome. In that part of the world, there were no roads in this part of the world. So it is a fulfillment of that prophecy. What is symbolized by the two lamb-like horns and then the ab absence of crowns? Notice, two horns represents the power, but there are no crowns on the horns. Have we ever had a king? Well, of course, the king of England thought he was our king, but not over, no one sat on the throne over here. It represents freedom of religion, Freedom of church, freedom of government, freedom of state. What has made this country strong is that we had a government with no king and a church with no pope. There was freedom for people to choose their government leaders and freedom for the people to choose their religion. And that's why it flourished and exploded and it was a new nation. I mean, you just read the plaque on the Statue of Liberty. Or go over here to Lincoln Memorial and read the Gettysburg Address and it reinforced, what did Lincoln say? This new nation. Will it survive? It was exploding with people who are coming seeking what? Freedom. And those principles that really first found root here are now going everywhere, aren't they? Oh, and by the way, please don't interpret anything I'm saying tonight as treasonous. I love my country. I am so glad I'm an American. Again, you know, as the same way I said, I'm not trying to pick on our Catholic friends or the papacy. I'm not trying to pick on Americans. When I travel abroad, as much as I love visiting other people and meeting new people and seeing new customs and tasting new food, when Karen and I came back from Russia, we praised God for Taco Bell. <laughs> After six weeks, I mean, you just want to get down and kiss the ground. If you, if, at least that's how I feel, and maybe it's just I'm a little bit patriotic that way. But the prophecies say as much as it hurts me to say it, just as some of our Catholic friends came up after the meeting, they said, Pastor Doug, this really hurts, but we know it's true. And just as it hurts me to say it, our country is not always going to speak like a lamb. Prophecies are telling us that the devil hasn't changed. Does it mean I'm changing my citizenship? No, as long as I'm allowed to practice and preach my convictions, I'm so thankful. What does it mean when the prophecy in Revelation 13, 11 says America will speak as a dragon? 
starts out like a lamb, but it says in verse 11 of chapter 13, he spoke like a dragon. Who's the dragon? It represents the devil. And remember the devil in chapter 12 where the dragon appears is working through the Roman Empire. We're going to speak the same way. All right, I want to talk to you a little bit about the law. When God wrote the Ten Commandments, how many tables did he write them on? Two. As I said before, it was not because he ran out of room on one and said, I better carve another one. He did it on purpose. There is a very clear division in the Ten Commandments. The first four commandments deal very specifically with our responsibility and worship to God. The last six deal with our relationship to man and they are civil in nature. No government should tell its constituents how to keep the first four. This is what Roger Williams started uh, the freedom of religion in our country was founded on these principles of you divide the Ten Commandments the way God divided them. You don't want to be part of a country that's telling you how to keep the first four or what you have is a totalitarian uh, dictatorship, a religious dictatorship is what you have. They're telling you how to worship and can you compel someone to worship God? Our country is not a theocracy. You're not supposed to do that. Freedom of religion. But you don't want to be part of a country that doesn't support the last six. Do you want the government saying, we're going to take care of your children, the parents have no rights? Do you want the government saying, marriage, it doesn't matter? And uh, do you want the government saying, we don't care if people steal your property or kill you? I mean, of course the government has to support the last six. I'm hearing very few leaders on both sides of the question understand where to draw the line. And we've got to know when unity's great and when you've got to say, I'm drawing a line when it comes to biblical truth, I'm not compromising truth for unity. What specifically will America do that will cause it to speak as a dragon? It says in Revelation 13, verse 12, He exercises all the power of the first beast before him. When did the first beast become a beast? The church in Rome made a lot of compromises, but it wasn't until they began to use an army that Justinian had given the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, to start compelling people to worship a certain way or they'd be punished. Did Jesus ever use physical force to get people to follow him? See, it's a complete uh, detour from the principles of Christ's teaching when that happens. The church and the state will unite and enforce religious practices. That's what happened all through the Dark Ages during the rule of the papacy from 538 to 1798. They used force to compel people to worship a certain way. When they did not cooperate, they could be tortured, they could be killed, their property could be taken away, they could be driven into the hills. Read the history about the Albigenses, the Waldenses, the Hussites. I think we've forgotten our history and someone once said, if you do that, you're doomed to repeat it. And I'll predict we're going to repeat it. The Old Testament history is being repeated right now. How does the second beast speak like a dragon? A nation speaks through its laws or its legislative body, right? It's not the superstars and the sports heroes that are speaking in behalf of the nation, are they? It's what does the government say? What are the laws? You know, I think it's very interesting. If you go to Rome, remember this. The papacy received its seat from the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire ruled by Caesars. As it began to crumble and Rome fell, at the same time it was waning, the papacy, the church, was waxing stronger. And they adopted many of the collective religions of ancient Roman Greece. The architecture of the papacy and their institutions is a lot of it is Romanesque. We, we agree with that? They walked around Washington, D.C. very in the very recent history. I mean, you can see a lot of similarities between the, uh, the Capitol and the, uh, the Vatican and some of the architecture. And the second beast will make an image to the first beast that had a deadly wound and was healed. Did ancient Rome have a senate? Do we? What calendar do we use? Gregorian calendar, named after Pope Gregory. And the months, you know where they get their names? They're the Roman names for the months. They're all messed up. For instance, uh, July is named after Julius Caesar. And Augustus Caesar was bothered that Julius Caesar had more days in his month, and so he wanted a month that was just as long, so he took some days from February. That's why August has got that, and February is so short. That's right, the Caesars did that. In the same way that ancient Rome was the undisputed leader militarily and in 
many other ways of the ancient world, who would you say is the world leader in those respects today? The United States of America. We're going to say more about that. Over what specific issues will force be utilized and the death sentence passed? Answer, and he would cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. A death sentence if you don't worship the way you're being told. It's all dealing with what? Worship. The word worship appears many times just in chapter 13. Worship, worship, worship. And so when you hear us talk about the Sabbath truth, what is it all about? It's what God you worship and what day you worship Him. It's the one commandment that principally deals with this, the day of worship. Christianity today. Notice this, Harold Linzel. All businesses, including gasoline stations and restaurants, should close every Sunday by force of legislative fiat through the duly elected officials of the people. In other words, it should be mandated. Uh, more and more, there's voices that are speaking up saying it should be forced by the government to tell us to worship. God can't bless our country because we're not worshiping when he tells us to worship on Sunday, what they call the Lord's Day. Pat Robertson's book, The New World Order, the author there says, the next obligation that a citizen of God's world order owes to himself, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, is the command of the personal benefit of each citizen. Higher civilizations rise when people can rest and draw inspiration from God. Laws in America that mandate a day of rest, Sunday laws, have been nullified as a violation of church and state. In other words, he says it's awful how the Sunday laws have evaporated. There used to be laws in our country telling people about work on Sunday. And as an outright insult to God and His plan, only those policies that can be shown to have a clearly secular purpose are recognized. He goes on then to say, It is not the duty of any particular group of people, it is not the duty of the church, but it is the duty of the government of the people to thus proclaim as a, a day as Sabbath to be universally observed throughout the length and breadth of the land, Sunday as the Lord's Day. If we as a nation would escape the doldrums of increased trouble, as God's hand rests heavily upon this people, opposition to Sunday, nationally declared, must cease. It needs to be supported by the government. Do you hear that? Am I reading anything into that? Maybe this is plain enough for you. I think some of us have heard of Reverend Jerry Falwell. All Americans would do well to petition the President and the Congress to make a federal law and an amendment to the Constitution, if need be, to establish the Sabbath as a national day of rest. You think he's talking about the Seventh-day Sabbath? No. And these are the sentiments that tell us which way the wind is blowing, friends. And I think we're on the verge of prophecy being fulfilled. What do you think? Could a government really control buying and selling? What does it say in Revelation 13? That those that don't worship the way they're being told to worship will not be allowed to buy and sell. Anyone here remember World War II? I mean, were you alive then? Eh, maybe you don't want to raise your hand. <laughs> I know some of our friends watching. Uh, Food and gas ration stamps were a common thing. Could they control buying and selling? In times of crisis, it's very common for the government to do that. Cannot buy or sell unless he cooperates. Anyone here ever heard of economic sanctions? Keep in mind, these prophecies in Revelation are talking about government powers. And so when it says those that do not cooperate cannot buy or sell, it's not just talking about the local person who wants to go to the market with their ATM and buy something. It's talking about governments of the world that do not cooperate with this universal worship that will be forced, will be locked out economically from the new world order, whatever they're going to call it, I don't know. Is it already happening where they use economic sanctions? Yeah, and it can be devastating when they blockade, I mean, you know, the chief producers of the products of the world are the nations that buy into these two powers, Europe, North America, even Australia is tied into Europe. They recognize the queen, right? And just about every other country in the world is some way tied into one of these powers. How strong and influential is the papacy today? Now, here are some amazing quotes. Some of you remember when this came out in Time magazine that after Reagan's tenure as president, it was revealed that he did conspire with Pope John Paul II. It was called the Holy Alliance. They worked to undermine the communism and quite successfully. This is from Carl Bernstein in that article. Reagan and the Pope agreed to undertake a clandestine campaign to hasten the dissolution of the communist empire. They started in Poland with the solidarity. Some of you remember Lech Walesa 
And it was a conspiracy to bring down communism. Did it work? Are they powerful? Is the papacy in the United States a powerful entity to consider? It goes on to say, uh, the U.S. ambassador to the Vatican, Thomas P. Medley, I believe the United States as the world's only superpower and the Holy See, that's the papacy, as the only worldwide moral political sovereignty have, signif have significant roles to play in the future. Their actions will impact the lives of people in all parts of the globe. And I think we've made a strong case for that. And I could just show you one picture after another of the presidents all the way back from uh, JFK to the present meeting with Pope John Paul II or Pope uh, Paul. Um, so, this uh, union stretching across the abyss, is it happening? I think we've seen it very clearly. How strong and influential is the United States today? The second beast, does it have the power to urge other countries to cooperate? Yeah, first of all, just consider for a minute. Economically, Wall Street is the dynamo of the economy of the world. Computer technology, medical technology, and you can go right down the line for the, the great methods of communication. It's the center for those things, the very powerful influences. What about military might? Would we agree that while we may not have the greatest number of soldiers, the technology and the power of the weapons possessed by the United States is unsurpassed. And with the breakup of the Soviet Union, and they don't have that consolidation that they had before, uh, and even since the first Gulf War, America has pretty much been recognized by the world as the ultimate superpower. And everybody's looking to us now to help police what's happening everywhere in the world. Is it clear that the influence and power of both the United States and the papacy are escalating with rapidity? What other factors could possibly help set the stage for a worldwide law to execute those who refuse to violate conscience? What does it say in Luke 21, verse 25? And there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things that are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then it goes on to say, and then they'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. Something's going to happen, signs in the sun and the moon, men's hearts failing for fear. Something is going to frighten. Will it be an economic collapse? I think that'll probably be part of it. Might be a terrorist act, could be a natural disaster. As world conditions worsen, what will Satan do to deceive the masses? Answer, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles that go out under the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Didn't the Lord tell us there will be false Christs? There'll be real prophets in the last days and false ones. Jesus is going to pour out His Spirit, but they'll be counterfeit. God came to the earth in the form of a man to save us. The devil is going to counterfeit that. Amen? They'll show great signs and wonders. Whereas if it's possible to deceive even the very elect, it will be so compelling and so convincing. Friends, how are you going to not be deceived? How can we prevent it? Answer, Isaiah 8, verse 20. According to the law and the testimony, the law and the prophets, the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus, the Bible, that's the only way we're going to know. Amen, friends? He goes on to say, if they don't go by the law and the testimony, there is no light in them. Finally, Revelation 3, verse 10. There's a promise for you. Write that down, friends. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will keep you from the hour of trial that will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Do you want God to keep you? It says, keep His commands. Don't lose the patience of the saints. You don't need to be afraid, friends, of what is coming. We can have peace during this time. We are living on the threshold of the end right now. And that's why God has brought you. He wants you to know He has a big plan for your life. He's got an eternal plan for your life. But ultimately, that comes from first accepting Jesus, the Prince of Peace, into your heart. Stay tuned. Pastor Doug will be right back with this week's special free offer. Does it matter what we eat? Some of you are thinking, but I like pork. 
Will God destroy me if I eat pork? Am I going to be in trouble if I eat something the Bible says is unclean? If we cooperate with the basic laws of health in God's Word, we would really help ourselves heal and live longer and feel better. I think so. You didn't do very well on your report card this last quarter, so... No. You haven't been pulling your weight around here lately. You want help? Well, I wanted help with the dishes last night. Help yourself. Huh? Honey, did you bring the marshmallows? Friends, it's amazing but true. The Bible actually refers to the United States in prophecy, and it reveals important details about the future of America. You owe it to yourself to understand these last day events and to be ready for what lies ahead. We'd like to help you understand the subject by sharing a free gift with you today. It's this study guide entitled, The USA in Bible Prophecy. It'll help you dig even deeper into this exciting topic. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and ask for offer number 181. If you prefer, you can simply write us at Amazing Facts, offer number 181, P.O. Box 1058, Roseville, California, 95678. Well, that's all the time we have today for this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Until we meet again, remember the encouraging promise of Jesus. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. This is your last chance to take advantage of this week's special free offer. There is no cost or obligation. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request. This presentation was brought to you by the Friends of the Amazing Facts Ministry.